I connected to seashell animals as a child. That was my connection to the fact that there was life in the ocean. This is evidence of animals that live here and evidence of this huge you know, life uh, underneath the sea. And that, to me, was a personal connection at a young age. I think that uh, to put our heads in the sand uh, and to say that we have um, huge climate change issues or huge ocean issues that we can't solve is not bettering our humanity in any way. And that's why I do the work I do. I'm inspired to make a difference. I'm inspired that people can make a difference. And I believe in the collective power of the human race. I think that when we put our heads together to do something good, that we can really do dramatic things for the betterment of our oceans and our waves. So Surfrider Foundation is partnering with uh, a number of different community groups and Oregon State University to put out some different pH monitoring units. So we install these in different special places. We're targeting marine reserves and protected areas. Uh, we collaborate with Oregon State University because they are the chief scientists. We simply assist them in changing and swapping out the units each month and we send it back to Oregon State University. They download the data, they read the data, and they feed us back the results. Ocean acidification is one of these big challenges. And what we need is as much information, as much understanding as we have about what's happening out there. But we can't do it alone. As scientists, we can only go to so many places, and we only know so many places. To paint a complete picture, we really have to enlist the help of folks who are out there on the coast, who know something about changes, and who knows how to get to sites. Measuring changes in our ocean environment, it, it's not something that only three people with very specialized PhDs in the world can do. It's something that all of us can have a hand in. And that's a really important message because the information that we're getting back is shared by people and they know exactly where it came from. I want my kids to walk down the beach and to see seashells. I want them to understand that you don't have to be in the ocean to know that there's life there that we depend on. And I believe that we can make a difference and we can connect people to making a change in the, in the world. I was brought in uh, at the end of 2007. Uh, Suka, the owner here, was having a lot of trouble producing larvae. It's normal to have some problems in a production season in an oyster hatchery, but these were persistent problems month after month after month of mortality. Well, at the time, we had no idea what the problem was. We thought um, bacteria was a major problem. But at that point, we were not thinking about carbonate chemistry at all. You know, we never did in our industry. So by accident, basically, we finally stumbled upon the fact that carbonate chemistry was affecting our, our initial results in the hatchery. So when we spawned oysters, they were dramatically impacted by low pH. When the pH of the ocean drops, there's less carbonate available for oysters to form their shells. And so that's more stress on the animal, which can result in catastrophic failures for larvae. In 2009, we started doing some pretty good data collection with Oregon State. They could tell us a lot about the carbonate chemistry of the water, and that really helped us to pin down the carbonate chemistry better. So at the Oyster Hatchery, there's been a number of uh, steps which they've now come to essentially be more resilient to ocean acidification. One of those uh, is just simply the monitoring and so understanding what the chemistry of the water coming into the, the hatchery is. One of the key things that they've done is buffer, what we say buffer the tanks. And, and so I equate that to uh, like we call it the Tums approach, and they're basically putting an antacid in the water. And what that's doing is raising the pH and increasing the saturation state, and that has changed or improved their uh, oyster seed production tremendously and restored a large proportion of that to what it was prior to the seed failures they were having uh, and they can, would continue to have without that buffering. So I hope that people, as we move forward, I don't want anybody else to see the impacts that we have, but they are going to, and I hope that we can be proactive enough to, to start working on it before it gets too late.
Um, so when we look at ocean chemistry, it, it might seem like, wow, there's nothing that we can really do locally as citizens, as communities to, to change that. But when we look at a, a really productive estuary and you see a vibrant green seagrass beds, well, those, uh, those plants are actually taking up CO2 as we speak. What we try, we're trying to do as a research community is to try to understand, hey, when and where are they drawing down so much CO2 that they can actually uh, ameliorate some of the changes that are already happening. And the early studies that are coming back, it's really promising. It looks like they, they have a really sizable imprint, fingerprint on the, the carbon dioxide chemistry that we're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. So my PhD research is focused on how seagrass and macroalgae in Pacific Northwest estuaries might be able to mitigate impacts of low pH or ocean acidification. And so I've been monitoring eelgrass communities and also pH and carbon dioxide in four different estuaries along the Pacific Northwest and particularly focusing in the South Slough estuary in Coos Bay. The Pacific Northwest is particularly vulnerable to ocean acidification. Uh, we've seen the progression of OA here happening much quicker than in other places in the world. And we also have this really tight coupling between the estuaries and oceans on the, on the West Coast. And so for those reasons, I think it's really important that we kind of lead the way as far as research and understanding and managing our coastal ecosystems for ocean acidification. The knowledge that can be gained here in the Pacific Northwest would then hopefully be applicable to other places in the world. The fact that you know, seagrasses could in some respect save the day uh, when it comes to ocean acidification, that's what you know, keeps me going. About a year or so ago, I took a marine science class at my high school. And the way that we started to get into that was we each had kind of our individual um, end of the semester projects. And the project that I decided to do was about how the ocean acts as a carbon sink. And I also learned about how an excess of carbon dioxide can lead to ocean acidification. I've heard about it before, but I wasn't entirely aware of how serious the issue actually was. And this really interested me, so I came to the Marine Science Center to learn more about it. And that's when I started becoming more aware about the effects that ocean acidification not only has on the environment, but can also have in terms of basically human society. So that's when I started getting into the Marine Science Program at uh, Port Orford. I helped deploy the pH sensor down at Rocky Point along with a team of three other people. By helping to deploy the sensor, I feel like it definitely helped us learn more about this issue and to help keep track of um, what's going on in our oceans. I think my generation through education, through taking action in their local communities on issues like this, that will be one of the best ways that they can make a big impact. As long as people are keeping track of what's going on in the oceans and we're able and willing to take action, then there's still hope. <laughs>